What's up everyone, Ben with the BTC Sessions here and this is your daily session. Huddle that Bitcoin. Now, of course, before we dive in here, I just want to remind everybody to check out my website, btcsessions.ca. There you can reach out to me directly if you'd like to book me for your own BTC session to learn about Bitcoin, how to set up a wallet, proper security, or really any overarching topic that you feel is relevant. Also, feel free to head over to my Teespring link down below and grab yourself some swag if you'd like that big dumb picture of me across your chest, your phone, your mug, whatever you like, or you can get a shirt that says your altcoin sucks. I'm sure I'll come up with some other stuff too, but that is a thing you can do. So let's dive in to the news today. Now, the first article here is from Bitcoin Magazine by Aaron Van Weirdham. And the title of this article is Taproot is Coming, What It Is, and How It Will Benefit Bitcoin. Now, Aaron in this, in this article doesn't just talk about Taproot. He talks about two other technologies. One is masked, Merkleized abstract syntax trees. Don't run away yet. It's not as scary as it sounds. And secondly, the other is Schnorr signatures. So that in combination with Taproot is what he's talking about here. Now, what are these things? Before we dive into that, I just want to clarify one thing. A lot of people think that Ethereum is the platform for smart contracts and Bitcoin does not have smart contracts. But that is technically incorrect because all of Bitcoin is a smart contract. Essentially, any Bitcoin transaction is a smart contract. When you send a Bitcoin transaction, what's actually happening is you have a script that locks up funds and that script says something like, if you present your private key, then you can unlock these funds and move them elsewhere. You also have slightly more complex contracts in the sense that you could have a multi-sig. That's where maybe you have three different keys that are allocated to a specific amount of funds. And the script would say something like, if you have two out of these three keys, then you can move funds from this account. You can also add things called time locks so that those funds cannot be moved until a certain block or a certain point in time in the Bitcoin blockchain. So we do have smart contracts, but they are limited. Now, what Taproot does, it enables much more complex smart contracts to be utilized on the Bitcoin blockchain. So you could have something like maybe you have two private keys allocated to specific funds and you can say, If you have both keys, then you can move the funds at any time. Or if you have this key, you can move the funds after a period of one week. Or if you have this key, you can move the funds after a period of a week if you also have a secret number provided. So you can get all of these ifs, ands, ors involved and it makes it much more complex. Now, the problem with something like this is that it takes up a lot of space on the Bitcoin blockchain because you have to program all of that information in as soon as you use that contract and you execute it. So every single instance of what could have happened is now communicated on the Bitcoin blockchain. Insert MAST or Merkleized Abstract Syntax Trees. This condenses everything where when you finally decide which way you're going to move the funds or it's actually executed, the only thing that needs to be stored in the Bitcoin blockchain at that point is the way in which you executed the contract. All of the other stuff can be shelved and doesn't need to be kept there. Now, on top of this, you can add in Schnorr signatures. Now, what do those do? This helps especially with things like multi-sig. So with a Schnorr signature, you can take those signatures and you can kind of condense them into a single one. And without getting too complex, any multi-sig transaction or contract like this would look like a simple and regular Bitcoin transaction from one address with a single key landing in another address. So it takes up much less space, plus it adds privacy on top of that because to 
a blind eye looking at the blockchain, well, to anybody looking at the blockchain, it just looks like a regular Bitcoin transaction. But under the hood, you have no idea whether it's multi-sig or a complex smart contract. So now these topics can be very, very dense and hard to sift through. I am still just barely trying to wrap my head around a lot of this stuff, but I'm going to link a few things down below. One is myself and Zach Vol from the coin pod talking about Schnorr signatures a while back. Again, we were just kind of starting to wrap our heads around the concept. Um, so feel free to take a look at that. That's kind of an easier talk through just like I've had with you. Um, I've also linked a video of Andreas Antonopoulos answering some questions regarding Schnorr signatures. I encourage you to watch that. He's, of course, a genius when it comes to explaining this kind of stuff. That's where I started to wrap my head around it. And then if you're looking to dive a bit deeper, I've included a lengthy video from Peter Woola where he gets into Taproot and Schnorr signatures, amongst some other things. That one is a little bit more difficult to wrap your head around, but I encourage you to watch it anyways. And finally, I'm also linking this this uh, article here from Aaron Van Weirdom. Now that I've kind of started to wrap my head around all of this stuff, this article puts it a bit more succinctly and I was very surprised reading through it that I was able to decipher a lot of what was here and hopefully I did a good job of it. But let's move on. So up next, we have an unfortunate story. Now, this lines up with a video that I did just the other day. So uh, Ryan Selkis is the founder of a, a I guess, a, a crypto research group called Masari. OK, they've got a great website. They do a lot of reporting. They have some great uh, metrics on pretty much every coin, not that I dive into other coins too much, but they put out a report the other day that more or less calls out Ripple and XRP for vastly overstating not only the market cap of the coin and how that's manipulated via funds not being able to be liquidated due to specific contracts with certain people, but also they vastly overstated their their daily volume due to most of the funds being traded. In fact, 99% of the trades happening overseas where there's no regulations and people are likely doing wash trading where you're gaming the system by selling to and buying from yourself. So it looks like there's demand for the coin. So anyways, of course, Ryan Selkis expected some online trolling from Ripple, from, from uh, the XRP army because they're exhausting to say the least but this quickly descended into death threats so he started getting calls to his house death threats online somebody call, actually called his house and s recited his wife's birthday to him and then hung up and eventually he the, here's the quote here someone just called me from a national number and recited my wife's birthday to me then hung up he calls out the ceo of ripple and says these are the type of animals you and your fucking company enable then he goes on to say i want ripple brad garlinghouse and lists off a bunch of higher ups in ripple to denounce any XRP community threats against my family. I'm going to the FBI and local police after three calls, ensuring our family doesn't get swatted. I'm going home. I'm not going home until it's publicly stated. It is pretty rough. Um, again, the problem is this isn't an isolated incident. You saw it happen with people like Jameson Lop and uh, Jeff Garzik. So they were both on either side of the fence with the Bitcoin scaling debate. And they both took a lot of hate from people, but they also had real threats against them. In fact, Jameson Lop, his house was even swatted. So I guess all I'm going to get at here is that it's far better to deal with opposing ideas, to battle them with better ideas than with threats and violence. Like, what the hell are you doing? Good job, XRP Army. Okay, let's move on. Now, this is my final thing I want to talk about today. And this is just a cool little tidbit of news that happened in the past day. So, 
the Block Street satellites, the uh, sorry, the Blockstream satellites. Blockstream is a Bitcoin centric company, and they've started putting up satellites around the globe. Currently, I believe their coverage is two thirds of the globe have access to this, and the goal is to give regular everyday people access to the Bitcoin blockchain, even without any internet connection. So you could have something, I just want to show you this here, you could have something like this. So this is a Bell satellite, it's $100. And this could receive transmissions from the Blockstream satellite and give you an updated state of the Bitcoin blockchain. You could also, so this could be say for an entire town, and you could receive the Bitcoin blockchain. You could then allow people to link into the current state of the Bitcoin blockchain via something like this, a Gotenna, which it allows you to create a mesh network, more or less your own private internet or open internet if you choose to make it so, to anybody that is within range of one of these devices. And they all communicate with each other and allow uh, information to be relayed. So you could essentially have the blockchain in an entire municipality just with a single satellite and a series of gotennas which is incredible it just shows how resilient bitcoin has become that you literally cannot shut it down we've got it beaming to us from space everybody from space anyways i'm excited about this it's cool Anyway, so they're experimenting with sending messages over, I believe, the, the Lightning testnet onto the Bitcoin blockchain. That's my understanding of it. I may have it a little muddled here. But essentially, there is uh, there's a developer that goes by the name Grubles on on. Twitter. And he was getting the satellite API broadcast. And somebody actually broadcast this cool little journal because they had to send one kilobyte of data via this thing to test it out. And so it reads like somebody's journal and it has all these fun little tidbits. So this guy, he said that he's a developer from a post-Soviet state he said, I'm building my first Raspberry Pi lightning node and broadcasting messages from satellites. It still feels surreal at times. He also went on to say that my dream is to accumulate one Bitcoin and I think that will be more than enough for the future. So the, the response to this is really, really cool. Like it's, it's just... The Grubles himself, he said, it's it felt like something out of Blade Runner when he stumbled across this this message on the blockchain by accident, more or less. And uh, he did save it as uh, he he archived it so that people will be able to find it for time to come. Um, and even Adam back from Blockstream ended up he retweeted it and he said that's great. And he said history rising. So. I love that. Things like this are what make Bitcoin really, really fun. And I'm always excited to see things like this pop up. Just that that resilience, that kind of cypherpunk ethos really coming through. So, guys, I hope you have had a wonderful week. Have a very great weekend. Remember, all the links to everything I talked about will be down below. Hit up my website. And I will see you guys after the weekend for the BTC sessions.